This podcast may contain adult themes. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The views and opinions in this podcast are expressly our own. When I get to the workplace, I like to fuck shit up. Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. Hey, are you tired of toxic workplaces and the negativity that comes with them? We hear you and we're here to shake things up. Welcome to Let's Break Up Toxic Workplace Stories, the podcast that's all about breaking up with workplace toxicity. I'm Nicola, and I'm here with my co-host Gina. Together, we're going to explore real-life experiences of workplace toxicity and offer a sense of encouragement and unity. That's right. We're tackling the tough topic of negativity in the workplace. So join us each week as we explore the various forms of toxicity in the workplace. We'll be interviewing guests to share their experiences and offer practical solutions for dealing with workplace toxicity. Let's Break Up is quickly becoming the go-to source for anyone looking to share and then ditch the drama and help you break up with those toxic workplaces. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to like, subscribe, and tell all your friends. In this week's episode. Okay, so... Oh, Nancy is already here. Okay, hold on. Before we get started, this is going to be the most fascinating interview I think we're doing. And fascinating, I think, for us, not for anyone else. No, it's going to be totally fascinating for everyone, including our our uh, listeners. Avid, because... Our avid listeners. I just think that it's going to be interesting. I think this is going to be, I think this might be my favorite episode that we've got coming up. Because at the I, think, bottom... I think I'm most excited about the topic. And, okay. you know, from her vetting, she seemed like really like on point and she wanted to do her research. So I'm very excited. Um, so I'll let her in now. Are you ready? Morning. Hello. It's actually We're good afternoon. Afternoon, whichever, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I keep, I keep forgetting. And now that it's daylight savings as well. Now we've gone even further apart in time right. difference. Right. And, uh, and I'm, I've been, I've been mesmerized because I've got all the news helicopters flying around outside my window oh, because of, Trump? of the Trump indictment. Uh, <laughs> where, where do you live? Are you in, um, BD? Financial no, district? I'm, I'm in, I'm in Midtown and I guess he'll be coming from, oh, okay. you know, from Trump tower down. And, got it, got it, got um, it. so, so I've been, all, I, cause all of a sudden I was like, what is going on? And then I was like, oh, right. That's today. So they're buzzing all over the place. Right. So they probably want to see him like leaving his place of residence and then. Yeah. You know, you know, cause it'll be live the whole time, you know, from nothing to, Hey, live, we're reporting about nothing. We don't know anything yet. <laughs> I know. I mean, I don't think we'll post any of this, but like, but what we can ask you about. We can is... ask you about a ton of other cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so and it, it sounds, wait, it sounds like you did like, you were like so awesome that you like waited and did some like research and deep diving. And that's amazing. And I can't wait to hear this. I think yeah, that... I, I watched the two the two episodes you wanted me to. Then I've watched some others. I took some notes based on the structure of the podcast. I, look, I want to do a good job for you. Oh, <laughs> thanks! I'm so excited. Well, do, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, let's introduce you first. Okay, so you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, just give us a general idea of who you are. I could, I could do a chat GPT. Oh my god. I could. Um, I feel like it's it's hit and miss at the moment. It, it well, is. They, I they asked it to write my bio and it didn't do a great job, but some of that is because it's only current through September 2021. I don't know if you knew yeah. that. because oh. It's not real-time information, so it's not like it'll go out to my website and pull information off of right, it. Right, right, right. Oh, okay. Okay, well then, okay, so you got it to write your bio. Yeah. However, it was not accurate. So- what, why don't you just tell some us stuff up. <laughs> who, you, who you are, what you're doing, why you want us to be on the podcast. Tell us as much as you want or as little as you want. All right. So, uh, so I'm Nancy Schick. I am an a, employment attorney and mediator. I'm based in New York City. I work with primarily employers on 
resolving workplace disputes before they get to court. So mm -hmm. it's it's also sometimes where the employees will come to me and say, I'd like to approach my employer about certain things, but I don't know how. And then other times it's the supervisors or the business owners that come to me. So I, I you know, as a mediator, I'm a neutral. So I work on kind of both sides. And I, and mm -hmm. um, look, I, I see it from the human perspective. And that's why I take the holistic approach is I know that, look, work is stressful for most of us. Very few of us have jobs that aren't stressful at mm -hmm. times, right? Mm -hmm. And what we know from psychology is when our, our emotions get high, you know, our, our ability to access our intelligence and the tools that we might use to resolve conflict, we, we kind of disconnect from them. So my job is to bring people down to a level where they can take action again. Mm. So that's pretty much what I do as mediator and attorney. And, you know, obviously with the, the view of the legal aspects of whichever action you take based on the role that you're in. Okay. So do you want to give us maybe a concrete example, one from the employee side, one from the employer side of something that you've worked on, and then we can get into our specifics? Because I know <laughs> in our vetting, we were kind of sharing some ideas that possibly this company didn't do things quite legally, especially in Nicola's case. So let's start with a couple examples not involving us so that our listeners kind of understand in real, like in a real tangible way, an anecdotal way. Yeah. So I think, you know, I can, I can use some very current ones that um, come up from the employee side where, you know, COVID brought some, some various mm -hmm. issues coming forward, for example, um, something that I saw a lot of was the accommodations, religious accommodations for the vaccine when we had mandatory vaccines mm -hmm. in, in the United States and the employers having to balance that because there was definitely um, an opportunity for people to raise either a religious exception or a medical exception to the vaccine mm -hmm. and employers weren't always prepared for that. So I think that's where I see consistently from the employee standpoint is a lot of times the employers that they're working with have these kind of blanket policies and they don't understand how to navigate the exceptions that are going to occur. And that's one of the things as a lawyer I'm constantly working with employers on is there's pretty much always an exception to every law. Of course, oh, right? of course. Like that's why there should be like contingency plans, right? Like, okay, exactly. if you don't want to get the vaccine, then are you okay to get tested every two weeks or whatever? Something like that, like something where you meet in the middle. Exactly. And I think you all, I know, I know a little bit about your story and, uh, and I think you all can see that the other thing that happens a lot of times is that employers stack employees with so much work that then anytime the exception comes up, the people that have to deal with the exception just want it over. And so they'll make a kind of knee jerk decision, right? The snap judgment that often will land them in hot water that because it's unfair, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it gets something out of their office and off of their plate, but it creates a whole host of problems for everybody else and can cause people to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely sure for sure um I think you know especially around mediation I think the work that you do there is is critical right because it's so difficult to maintain and you know or find someone that can maintain that really good balance of here are the employer's needs and these are the employee's needs and here's where I'm standing on this middle ground to not um to not kind of fuel on the fire for either side how right. do you feel um how do you feel some of your training has kind of put you into that position to be able to best decipher or navigate that kind of um, balance between the two so one of the things that I have to work on constantly right and I know this because of the training and having the the awareness of it is just recognizing that I'm constantly doing this too, right? I'm, my brain wants to judge because that's how the human brain works, right? Mm -hmm. And I have to go, 
okay, I get that you're wanting to make this decision, but shh. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I have a whole system that, you know, I, I put in my book and, and that I use in my in my practice um, that helps me do that so that I can kind of keep myself in check. And I think that's what I'm getting at. What I even mentioned with those, you know, those snap decisions. It's about slowing people down. But I mean, we've all we all know that. How many times have we been taught that since we were kids, like count to 10? Right. When you're upset. Yeah. That's fine, but if you don't know what to do when you get to the number ten, <laughs> okay, you're sure. calmer. What's the point? Yeah, right? you're, you're calmer, but you still don't know what to do, so you might just take the wrong action in a calmer way. Right. Right. So, so I have the training that helps people like move to the next step, and so it's it's about looking. You know, one of the one of the fam- favorite exercises that I give that I get a lot of good feedback on is. When you're in conflict with somebody at work, one of the first things I'll have that people do is go and and make a list of 10 things that you think that other person contributes to the workplace. Why were they hired? Right? What do you think? What do you think their job is about? Why do you think they were hired to fill that job? If you were the one that hired them, why did you hire them? Right? <laughs> because we have this tendency to like demonize the other side when we're feeling upset about the, about our yes. circumstances. And then we forget that that's a human being on the other side. And just like we make mistakes and we want to be given a little leeway to correct them. We forget that the other person is human too. So I rehumanize that situation. And then we start talking about okay, now that you remember that's a human being on the other side, let's look at what those objective goals were. You know, what was it that you came together to create? And why aren't you moving in that direction? And then we, you know, because when you start taking that emotion out of it, and you can focus then on on a very objective problem, like that's why we have KPIs and we have various measurements, right? It's so that we can see progress. And I try to do that even within a conflict situation. So that makes mm-hmm. sense though, right? You want to make you want to make sure that you're still um kind of seeing eye to eye and that, you know, that outside of the mediation, you kind of get to a point where you can actually have a civil or working relationship. Obviously, right. normal right. You don't, in, yeah, in you don't situations, to... that's not happening. But in a beautiful yeah. world of unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> and it's true. And you have to have like once one of the things that we tell people all the time is like, look, mediation is voluntary. And I have walked away from mediations before because it was clear that one of the parties was just adamant that they had to be right. Yeah, I was going to say they had to isn't win, they had to be just controlled, like, right? Like more or less coming to a compromise where you're meeting in the middle, right? So it's like, if one party's already like dead set that they're not going to budge, there's not much a mediator can do. Right. Yeah. Right. Like if you're, if you've already decided that that other person is an absolute demon with no redeeming qualities and that there's no way that you're going to be able to find anything that you can do together in your work situation, like you've already kind of quit, right? Yeah. Why are we What's talking about it? Right. I, I have people not in my work really not really with work but I have people in my personal life from the past that I'm like I, they're there's no redeeming quality they are a waste of flesh <laughs> so <laughs> I get it yeah and and look there there are also like people in my life and I think we might have even talked about this in, in our first uh chat is Look, I have people in my life who I still love, but I, I say I love them from afar. Yeah. Right. Because I can't have them in my orbit. We just we're we don't work well together. And that's right. okay. I don't need them to die. <laughs> right. I just don't need to have them too close to me and in my day to day because yeah. they just want my life. Yeah. That's Agreed. True. That's yeah. so true. Totally. Okay, so now that we have a better understanding, do you actually you do you actually ever go to litigation? Is my question. I do still a, a little bit. Um, it's not my preferred method okay. of conflict resolution, but I do still litigate. I've been litigating since the beginning, and you may or may not remember this that I've been a plaintiff in an employment situation. 
So I have experienced employment law as an HR supervisor, as an attorney, as a plaintiff, as de defense counsel, as a mediator. The only thing I really haven't done is been a judge. But I do, I do serve as an arbitrator for FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And so I do occasionally kind of serve in sort of a judge role on a panel. Okay. That's so Wait, judgy. You, I know. Why were, you, why were you a plaintiff? Do you want to share I, a little bit about that? Because that's I was very in a toxic workplace. to me. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. So, um, you know, and I, because uh, I thought you were going to ask about toxic workplace story. And I was like, we yeah, are. I got one. And I think the Let's worst hear one it. Probably, probably the one that I sued, although it's not the only one that I've ever been in. Right. Um, of course. Yeah. It's, and See, I was, in, it seems, it seems as though, like, as we're going through this podcast in general, everybody, well, obviously everyone we've spoken to, but it seems <laughs> like, it Nicola. seems like everybody wants you get chatting to them about their workplaces, everybody seems to have a bloody toxic workplace story. Like a person, Joe Blog on the street has got a bloody toxic workplace story. What is happening in society? Well, so I was, I actually had therapy this morning, which is why I'm so regulated right now. Um, <laughs> and we were talking about how quickly our po podcast has kind of like started doing stuff. Like we thought it wasn't going to do. And I was like, I thought everyone talked about like, their bad workplace experiences. And my therapist was like, they might like internally, like maybe to their friends and family, but they don't label it toxic and they don't ever bring it up at the workplace for fear of retaliation. You know. and, right. And she was like, you might be able to get away with it if you're like a big money maker or like C-suite where you're identifying a problem, but mostly- like the people who are workers among workers, which are the majority of us, you know, we're, it's like a touchy topic. Do you bring it up? Do you leave? And there's all those things that go with it. So tell us what happened with your toxic workplace. Yeah. So I, and, and I'll, I also want to like piggyback on what you were just talking about. Um, look, one of the reasons I can talk so freely about this now, I mean, one, it's public record in the state where I filed it. Right. <laughs> so that's one thing. So you could go look it up. Right. Oh. But, um, but I, it's not like I openly talked about it when I was still working for other people. Sure. Part of the reason I can do it now is I work for myself and I work in this space. So I completely get what you're talking about is people yeah. are afraid of, you know, there's still a stigma as much as we'd like to think that you can, you can assert your rights at, at, at one employer and it not carry forward in another, right? Like they, they might look you up, right? Just like they're going to look at your social media profiles and they, you might not know why they didn't call you for an interview, but it might be that they found out, for example, for me, that I had been a plaintiff in an employment law lawsuit, right? Were, so, were you the so, single plaintiff or were there other people? I was, I was working for a small employer in a, um, I may, I guess I may as well be as, as relatively public. I'm careful because, you know, in one way it's, it's been a long time ago. It was in the nineties. Um, mm -hmm. I was working in the sport industry and mm -hmm. I was working in a, basically a C-suite, but in a tiny, tiny, you know, team right. and, and with multiple owners and, Let's just say I left a really good job, even though the sport industry has its share as still to this day, many years later, we're still hearing a lot about sexual harassment, sex discrimination, sure. racism, et cetera, in that industry in particular. Um, and I had come out of HR. So I was a little bit, you know, I'd worked at, at United Parcel Service in human resources. So I got amazing training. And then I, I was getting my degree in sport. So I said, I should go work in it took a job with this team and it turned out to be, you know, my dream job turned out a little bit like a nightmare for me. <laughs> and, you know, and, and in retrospect, I can also, you know, the mediator and me can see where I contributed because I didn't know how to handle things, which I know we're going to get to, right? right? It's like, what are some of the tips? And, and so I can see where I had some expectations that, for example, that, oh, 
we don't have sex discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. <laughs> right, <laughs> like that's I what she thought. Young. But in the nineties, <laughs> I mean, I was in corporate America in the early two thousands, which is not far off, and it was still somewhat acceptable. I was sexually harassed by my boss at a small company, um, and it was somewhat culturally acceptable. I found it unacceptable. Other women found it unacceptable, but you know, in the cultural, in the the zeitgeist, it was still somewhat acceptable, which is like, now that I think about it, right. Cause we we've come so far, but, um, yeah. Anyway. So, so you expected them to treat you like just a human, like a smart human who could do the job. And then they were like, um do tits the curtains out, match old boys tits out, full do boys. The, do curtains wait does the rug match the drapes or the curtain what is it curtains match, <laughs> match something the- like that yeah, yeah i don't whatever. think it was quite that but yeah it was you know, you know was definitely- but then there, or they'll be like your you your boobs look really perky today or how do you stay so thin or oh, something right ass. yeah yeah, or, or something oops, I got that, or you know, really, what it it was more subtle um, in this environment, I think. Yeah, um, makes sense. And you know, because I did have a high level position, um, I what I observed more on the sexual harassment was, you know, it was the subtle putting their arms around you, you know, oh. coming behind you to look over your shoulder for the, you know, to see what you're working on on the computer. You know, or like we, guiding okay. you through the door, like with on the small of yes. your back. And, okay. and having, okay. you know, so for me, if you're coming up close and looking over my shoulder on my screen, for me personally, that's worse for me than if you were to give my boob a squeeze. <laughs> I don't, you might be right. Like, if I, I, it freaks me out so bad. If you're like, ru- I can't like I can't and like actually just even thinking about it makes me because it's like it's so like um predatory kind of right because it's like and you're trapped over you're trapped yeah like they're over you you can't really do too much about it grab a boob grab a boob it's fine (laughs) Don't grab a boob either. The lawyer is don't don't touch someone in the workplace unless it's like a mutual hug. But you bring up genders. And I'm glad you you kind of hit on this, Nicole, because you know, one of the other things is we forget that sexual harassment is and 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 even sexual assault is more about control. Mm -hmm. And so what you're talking about is also like, yeah, somebody's joking around, they maybe touch you in a way that's playful is a completely different experience than if they're hovering or, you know, somehow taking up your space. And if they're larger than you, right, you do feel that dominance in your space. And that it is. And, and, and that was another thing, like, you know, things that, I still even say to the bar associations that, you know, we know we have issues, for example, with um, alcoholism in the profession, and yet we still have a lot of meetings with open bars. And that was the experience I even had at this particular team is, you know, obviously you're trying to get people to come. I get it. We have our conferences, but look, the you got a lot of people that maybe don't manage their alcohol consumption well, and you're putting them all in a space that's very, to coin the, you know, to coin a phrase that gets thrown around all the time, the toxic masculinity kind of environment of, of sport. I saw that that's what I was in, but I still was naive enough to think that I could make a difference there. Right. So, so did you leave and then sue them or did was there one incident that happened that you were like that's fucking it and I'm suing now yeah so I I actually have a video out and and where I tell a little bit about the story but um but but it's okay it's it's good I'll you know I'll but I talk about how I didn't want to sue what happened was I was let go right and then when I when I went to get my back wages, you know, the, my commissions and things that they owed me, I just wanted enough money 
because, you know, I didn't expect severance or anything like that. I just wanted enough money because I'd moved halfway across the country, right? Uprooted my life, left good jobs, left my family and was living in this small town in Texas. And I just wanted enough to get me to my Why next- Why do home. all toxic workplaces start in Texas? What the <laughs> hell? Do you? Yes, that's our, ours was Texas. So, I mean- Oh, that's right. And, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what the fuck? What, what the, just Texas? What am I drinking? Why? What Kool-Aid? Isn't Waco in Texas as well? Yes. <laughs> what is the, what's in the drinking, the tap water, Texas? And that's it's really that. interesting that you said Waco because I was just a little bit south of Waco. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. But it was, it was, right? So I just wanted a little bit. I called the um, wage and hour division because I just wanted to collect what I was owed. You know, I was like, that would get me a little runway. I'm a hustler. I'll go get me my next thing. You know, wasn't that worried about it. I got on the phone with the government and and this is what I tell clients all the time. This is what's going to happen. Your employee's going to call for assistance from the government and the government's going to listen and they're going to ask them questions and they're going to find out if you did anything other than what they called for, right? They're going to find out and they're going to do what they did with me. And they encouraged me to file a claim. Well, it was, it was wage an hour. So it wasn't oh, unemployment. Okay. Although later that was another thing that caused the lawsuit was then they blocked my unemployment. Right. So they were, Why? it's like, not, not only were they like withholding my, some of my earnings, then just out of the vindictiveness of it all blocked my unemployment. Um, It was awful. I lost, you know, I lost one of my closest friends that I had worked with there because Mm -hmm. he had to testify against me and I had to testify against him. And I talked, I ended up talking about things that I probably would never have talked about. But once I got an attorney, right, the attorney starts fleshing out the case because that's what we're trained to do. And we, Mm -hmm. you assert every possible claim that you think you can prove. It wasn't, and I was young, so I completely deferred to my attorney. In Mm -hmm. retrospect, I might have done things a little bit differently had I, you know, been who I am today. And maybe I would have preserved some relationships that I've repaired at this point, right? We're we're cool. Um, not as close as we were when we when we were living in the same town, but right, you kind of see, right? Why'd you why would you want to live in Texas at this point anyway, Nancy? You're it's true. To I'm in New York City. Why would why right? Like why would why you want to live anywhere more? else? You crazy so person. Maybe Paris or London or Berlin. Yeah, well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I ended up winning a default judgment that I was never able to collect a penny off. I hate that shit. What? Yeah, they fled the country. Oh my God. They fled they the country. Fled the country? And- <laughs> yeah. What? This has everything. This has sexual harassment. Friendships being shattered. Fleeing Law the cases, country. like court cases. It's got everything. How much were you suppo- supposed to get, which we know you got zero, but zero. how much were you supposed to get? $90,000. Not bad in like the 90s. That's probably yeah, like- Yeah, that was good. That was really good money. That would have paid for my laws, my law license, or, you know, my law, my law. Right. Yeah. It would have paid for everything. And uh I, like I said, I got a really good education of being like, I didn't expect that. I knew I wanted to go to law school, which is one of the reasons I took the job in Texas, because I'd been working for uh, an organization that had two teams and I was working baseball and hockey and they would overlap. So I was working year round and never had an off season. So this was a chance to work in hockey and then maybe go to law school in the summers. I didn't know mm-hmm. I would be going to law school, learning the uh, learning about civil procedure, both in the classroom and in the courtroom simultaneously. <laughs> that's one way to learn. That's, that's one way to get right into your education. Exactly. Yeah. And that's how I ended up, you know, kind of ending going into mediation is because I saw all the possibilities of the process being friendlier and building, you know, keeping those relationships together. Yeah. Had they, had they just talked to me about what I was really looking for? I wouldn't have been looking for $90,000. You were just like, give my me back and let me get my commission. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not that big of a deal. Like there, anytime you, you're, you have a salaried employee, you're, you're already paying into unemployment insurance. So 
it's really it has nothing to do with them like maybe the right. unemployment insurance will go up by like 10 cents the next year but it's like it's not even a significant amount to deny someone unemployment because you're already like they're already paying into it so it's so like ludicrous that they would have done that so two follow-up questions uh -huh. is the people who flee the country do you know where they are right now I haven't bothered to look, to be honest, you know, that's okay. so far yeah, in my curious. past. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm assuming they're still, you know, out of the country running their next business or probably even invested in some other teams. <laughs> probably. Um, <laughs> and some and other then, businesses and doing lots of different things, right? <laughs> then my, my final my money. Follow -up question is, <laughs> what did you let, get let go for? And did you agree with the reason? <laughs> that's a that's a okay. tough one yeah because okay. you know if you were to ask me this back during the during the beginning um I might have said they were they set me up and I still kind of feel like they did set me up the team that I worked for was still partially owned by the league they were it was a brand new league and we had like 13 owners and some of them were trying to remove one of the other ones from the day-to-day -day control. So they asked me to help them basically with the vote, help them, you know, so I was going around talking. So they lobbied to you to vote to move him out. Okay. Yeah. And then Understood. when I did what they told me to do, being that they were owners and therefore my bosses, but not all of them, right? So basically when... I did what they told me to do. They fired me. <laughs> do you think that, do you think that was to appease some other owners? Like, yeah, what I, what I later found out was that, you know, the league didn't want to continue owning, of course, when we hit our first game, right. They wanted, the plan was to hold it until they found somebody to, to take, to buy out their shares, but they wanted to get the league moving and, the owner, from what I understand, I don't know, this is again, you know, kind of secondhand information, but the the new owners that were coming in had a son who wanted my job. <laughs> so um, awkward, wow. right? Because yeah, I, kept asking, I kept asking from like the day two or so um, of when I arrived, like, where's my employment contract that you all promised me? And they kept delaying and delaying and delaying. But, you know, even then, before I went to law school, I knew that I, that there's still something called a spoken contract, even if it's not memorialized in, in writing. So I kept going, like, it's going to be better for us to have it in writing, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't fatal to my claims for the agreement being breached. So that was the other part of it is it was a, you know, that's how cases go is mm -hmm. it starts with maybe wage an hour and then it becomes breach of contract also sexual harassment, sex discrimination, et cetera. And you basically put everything in as multiple causes of actions in the same, in the same lawsuit. And that's mm -hmm. what started to roll out. So as you piece things together, you start to realize that there was a lot more going on than you knew as I'm sure you all experienced. <laughs> now that we know more about you, can you tell us your thoughts on we uh, what we discussed in our first few episodes? So yeah, where do you want to start in particular? You, you tell us. You tell, you tell us. us. You I, feel like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, yeah. I feel like you I have lots of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so start from the top. Let's start from the top. What have you got? So... You know, I look at at kind of where you all started. The first thing that was a, a red flag for me, I'll be honest, was when you have these people that kind of start as contractors and then move into an employment setting, right? Mm -hmm. Like basically doing the exact same job. That's always a red flag for me, right? That tells me that this is a workplace, at least in in New York in New York State. That's a workplace that isn't really clear on what those boundaries are of you know how to mm -hmm. how to properly classify someone because you it's not about just flipping a switch right and putting a different label on it right it's like it's it's like there are very specific legal criteria that determine who's an employee versus an independent contractor so that was one of the first things that i said ooh 
That's interesting. But I also understand that, that your employer had been based in Texas. And I don't want to accuse anyone of anything because I don't know Texas law. Um, when I was there, it was many, many years ago, right? And lots of lots of things have changed. And I also know that New York is more employer friendly than a lot of other states, especially Texas. Is that so, in New York and California, I think? is Are they very employer friendly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so usually my colleagues in, in New York, New Jersey, um, California, um, Illinois somewhat because of Chicago, a lot of, a lot of places that have highly concentrated metropolitan areas tend to lean a little bit more in, in those directions. Now I can't, you know, say that's, that's going to be certain, but I think you even see that globally that you right, like you see London, you see Berlin, you see Paris, which are even more, <laughs> you know, even more employee friendly. Um, New Zealand is very employee yeah, New friendly. New Zealand is employee friendly. If you're creating exceptions for the wrong reasons, like cronyism or money, <laughs> right? And only making it on those decisions then you're going to end up with people who feel justified in breaking the rules. Right. Right. And I think that's what we, we see is so even though we have strong employee protections, especially, especially in, in New York and New York city, um, you, you also have a lot of, look, you have a lot of people working here who are undocumented Mm -hmm. who don't know their rights, who are afraid to assert their rights because they are undocumented. So they are frequently abused by employers. That's horrible. It's, it is you know, horrible. It's, it's just, I, like I said, I see the humanity of all of this. And yet I also see the middle managers who want to do the right thing, but they also need to keep their jobs. Right. So they're, right. that's why they're middle, right. It's, then they're feeling pressure from both directions. And so that's what I try to work with people on is let's find some solutions to balance all of those interests because you're always going to have competing interests. No system is going to be able to run itself, right? right. You got to have human beings to run it and human beings, we're a little messed up. That's you don't say. Okay. So what was your <laughs> second red flag when you were listening? So it was the fact that Nicola was started, was technically a contractor, but was and part-time, but was working full-time and really a full-time employee. So, so, you know, and I, and I have to, you know, throw in my disclaimer again, that, you know, although I'm, you know, I'm, 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 Acknowledging some of the things that I would personally explore more deeply, I can't say how it would have played out. Um, yeah, at, because the the oh, other thing, the other thing that comes in is one, the employer was based in in Texas. You were based in New Zealand, right? So most of the time, the laws that are going to apply, and I don't think employers already always know this, are are the laws of the location of the employee. Which actually means, because I know our employment law, because that's what I'm studying right now. Exactly. Right? And I'll tell you what, as a very employee friendly, and if you are being, essentially, if you are being paid a consistent salary, um, essentially, the employer should be paying your tax, your insurance, your, you know, your 401 and your equivalent of 401k like there's a ton of stuff that they should be doing um but your statute of kind of space to get in a claim is only 90 days wow so we're far wow. beyond that at this point yeah 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 and and so that was that's definitely you know something that you're you're hitting on that i i, I work with a lot of employers on that after they've gotten hit gotten hit with a penalty because they didn't realize that that person who's sitting in New York, even though you are based in where even another country, if your employee is here in New York, that employee is protected by New York law. Yeah. Right. And if they're in New York City, they also have the protection of New York City law. Right. And so a lot of employers don't know that. And they, you know, they set up and they expand. And then we saw that during the pandemic, people moved around. Yeah. Right. 
So, you know, now your, your employees who might have been in New York City said, whoa, it's too expensive to live here. I'm going to go live, you know, closer to my parents in Ohio. And now your, your employee is governed by Ohio law, right? So that's yeah. one of the things I saw that I would have been exploring more. I would have um, also looked at, you know, just some of the other things about the way that your discharge was handled. Um, the like, look, when there's not a clear process that's again kind of compassionate, I usually know that that's an employer who either is very inexperienced with letting people go and therefore, you know, likely to step in it, <laughs> right? And it's so, you know, like in one way, I want to say that's normal right? Nobody's good at something when they've never done it before, yeah, sure. but you, when you, you have to be aware of that, right? Like if you're a new business, one of the things you need to start thinking about is where your weaknesses are. And don't assume that just because you hire someone, you're like, we're not robots. And even if, you know, I know you've been playing with chat GPT. So, you know, that even the robot you have to give it very specific instructions to very get the, specific. To get, right to get the output that you want. So it's amazing to me that we forget that with human beings, right? <laughs> and and so I see that as like this this kind of dehumanization of employees that occurs in a lot of workplaces, as though you are already robots. Like I'm going to hire somebody. I'm just going to throw all this stuff at them and now I'm relieved. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. I like to think about employment as a partnership toward mutually compatible goals, mm -hmm. right? And yet we, we still function a lot in the world, a lot of workplaces as this like, please, sir, give me a job, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, like we're little Oliver Twist going, please, yeah. you know, <laughs> and yeah. And yet, like, that's not the way most employment works, right? Like Jeff Bezos would not be so wealthy without the employees who do the day-to-day -day work. But for some reason, we set up our society like, oh, he did it all on his own. There is no freaking person on this earth who is self-made. It's ridiculous, right? So I really work with employers on that of like, you got to start looking at employees as part of the whole with mm -hmm. respect. And I think we're moving in that direction. And I, I'm, I'm actually doing an, another, another podcast later in the month talking about AI and how it's going to change that and make people better. Ooh, I feel like <laughs> so, be cool. Fun chat. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun chat PC. GBG. You all right, Nicola? You good? <laughs> what is it? Chat B X Y Z. What is it? <laughs> GPT. Chat C V G. Okay, symptom. wait. So what was your next um red flag with both Nicola and my departure story? And and the other thing was this shocking, right? There was an employee theft. Yeah. Right? There yes. was an employee theft that was kind of glossed over. And, you know, that's another thing, like, look, I get it, right? I, as an, as a business owner myself, I, I had some, I had an employee that stole from me, right? Didn't necessarily know how to handle it. Cause when you're in a small environment, you, you do it, start yeah. to see the humanity, right? And, and there's kind of this shock that comes with it too. Like you, you can't imagine that somebody that you know that intimately would steal from you. Right. And I've, and I've worked with employee employer clients that have had this situation too, but it was this like weird focus on that and, the, and kind of the inability to overcome that for the purpose of the business. Right. That's why I said, I, I work with people on trying to extract the emotion so that they can look objectively on what should happen in that situation. You mm -hmm. can't, like as a business owner, not just for your business, you, you have to be able to assert yourself to protect the business. But when you gloss over those kinds of things, 
what message does that send to the rest of your workforce about their value and what you expect from them? And it and it's that inconsistency. I think that was that that was right, one of the things like, that I Because like, why was seeing. Nicola and myself fired when the girl who stole is most likely still there? Yeah. So yeah. like, where's the logic in any of that? Yeah. This this also the CEO on the pedestal that you mentioned, what responsibility do you have to the people who are following you, right? You have to, you have to up your game to be worthy of that kind of leadership. Otherwise you have the potential to lead people down dark, dark places. I think the biggest difference, and I don't know, Nicola, if you would agree with me, is that you and I are inherently self-reflective and we'll call ourselves out on our bullshit. Like, I'll be like, no, I absolutely overreacted. I absolutely said the wrong thing. Like, apologize for it. Say, no, I was wrong. Like, I have no problem admitting it. Whereas the leader that we're all referring to had no ounce of self-reflective ability. Nothing. Yeah. There was no ability to look inward and say like, Maybe I can do something different. Maybe I can do something better. Maybe, you know, like we just did this whole follow-up um, thing with somebody and um, they were like, it doesn't seem like the owner, CEO and COO took any accountability for anything. And that's it. They just would always point the finger. They would attempt to be like, oh no, that was my fault. But really, then they would go go around and talk to the person who they really thought their fault it was their fault. So I think that's a big, a big thing that changes that that like would differentiate someone like myself from someone like our previous boss. Yeah. And, and that's a really good point too, is I I I like that you're hitting on this balance with both consistency right because in order to build trust in someone who's who's leading us we need to see some consistency in their behavior right but in another way we want to leave them room to grow right and become better so you have to have that self reflection as well and and so one of the best ways to create consistency is by exhibiting self reflection like not being you know, self-absorbed about it, right? <laughs> and becoming, it's always about that. But being able to look more objectively at a situation and say, what happened, mm -hmm. right? And then, okay, here's how we're gonna fix it going for, you know, forward. Here's my contribution, right? It's what I call that complete apology of not just I'm sorry, but I'm sorry for blank, or I acknowledge that this, you know, it's I did like this. It. And it caused this result. And here's how we're going to make sure we don't end up with that result again. And here's how I'm going to do it, right? This is my contribution and I'm going to own this part of it. And what we we see is a lot of people just, you know, look at how many people go publicly after they've been outed on social media or whatever, and they come Oh my forward. God, my sorry bun. God. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. I'm so sorry, right? And then you're I like, do you mean know for way. what? Right. Like, what yeah. are you sorry for? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the young man who assaulted me said, I'm sorry. But I was like, for what? Were you sorry you assaulted me or are you sorry you got caught? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And you and you don't know. And you don't. Right. Unless it's qualified by all those things. And then the behavior consistently showing that you mean yeah. a change. And, and so there were some of those things that it, it sounded yeah. like you weren't seeing and, and we were not, that is, and correct. it, and it is that kind of, it's a classic thing that I see in businesses that kind of explode where they have to put a bunch of people on quickly to handle the growth of the business and the opportunities, and they don't have the infrastructure, right? Yeah. And so that's, which I that's, think is the most frustrating thing for me in this whole instance is I tried to put the infrastructure in and nobody listened to you. Nobody did. Nobody was interested because I was like, this is going to happen eventually. Didn't think it would happen to me, but I thought it would happen eventually and put the infrastructure in to protect everybody that's involved. Usually a little bit of a red flag. It's, it's awful to say this, but it's usually a client that I may end up having 
right? Because they're going to end up having some sort of issues issue. and they may, they may have to come to, to someone like me. Unwillingness to evolve, to hear, to grow, to come together. Like when you hear things like, um, I, I, I know I made a, I, I don't remember who said, uh, I'm not here to pet your mental health. Um, that kind of thing of like, you know, not, not necessarily, oh, and can't shine brighter than the CEO, right? Like kind of this only certain people matter. That's usually a red flag for me, right? Is mm -hmm. that that tells me that probably the employees are not being treated really well and are not being valued for their contribution to the whole. And that is just, an, it's a recipe for problems. It's a recipe for complaints. Um, it suggests to me that, you know, a lot of the complaints that we know are underreported mm -hmm. are probably going on in those workplaces, right? I don't think people were willing to say anything because we just found out that um, this former employer found out about our podcast and then sent an email to certain individuals saying that we're just disgruntled employees. There needs to be balance, right? Like you're, you are a human being, even like we don't even drive our cars all the time, right? We, we, we let it rest. We take it in for maintenance. So it's like, why are we treating human beings less favorably than we treat our machines? Right. And so when I, when I heard that, I was like, that is a culture that doesn't, it doesn't produce the best results. And this is also from a standpoint of, we know best practices with employee relations. We know that there is no such thing as multitasking. Your brain is flipping back and forth constantly at high speed. And you're not effective when you're doing that. So if your Slack is going off nonstop while you're trying to work, whatever you're working on, even if you don't pick up that, it's still distracting you, right? Your brain is like, whoops, disconnect, whoop. Mm -hmm. And it takes you, I mean, right? So you're not getting the best work from your employees. It, I, I can see it in myself, right? If I'm not getting enough sleep, I used to think it was a, you know, a badge of honor, right? That I worked so many hours. Yay. Look at me. I'm so tough. And then I realized when I, after I got assaulted and I had to sleep more right, because I was recovering, I realized I got about the same amount of work done because I was rested mm -hmm. and because I was taking yeah. care of myself. Right. Yeah. And so yep. I think that's another thing that, you know, I hear differently now is if you're not giving your employees time to balance their lives, you're not getting the best from them. No. So yeah. a couple of follow-up questions um, from me and then Nicola, you can have your follow-up questions. You mentioned a couple of times getting assaulted. Did that happen at a workplace? It did not, um, okay. but it's a, big, it's a big part of my story because it changed the way that I work and it changed my focus. It changed my, it, it changed a lot of what I wanted to do. You know, I was still litigating a lot more at that mm -hmm. point. And I realized that this was, this was really what I wanted to be doing was getting mm -hmm. in the middle and helping people resolve the conflicts before they get into court. Because I also believe, and I saw it after the assault is that once it gets into court, like you lose a certain degree of control you and do. And, you know, basically when you go to court, what you're saying is, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to resolve it. We need it. A, a third party to yeah. Yeah. tell me what I, Tell me what I deserve. Right. Right. Tell, mm -hmm. tell me who's right and wrong. It's a very, you know, binary situation. Usually it's a mm -hmm. zero sum game. It's one, one party wins, one party loses. Mm -hmm. Right. And it ends up most people walk away even when they win. Like I want a judgment, but it didn't, one, I didn't collect anything. And two, it didn't solve How any of the other things. That you can't collect on the judgment. Yeah. And, and, you know, I can give the general answer on this is you would. It probably, depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> <very good. laughs> but, but, Fair. you know, generally it's um, you would, you would have to seek a judgment 
that would seize their assets, right? You would have to go through the collections process. And again, it's going to vary from state to state, from, you know, country to country. Yeah. Okay. So what are your follow-up questions if you have any, Nicola? You know, I think, I think for me, I'm for sure curious to know what your like general or overall impression is of the workplace that we were at. Um, because we've kind of gone into a couple of the specifics, but I'm curious to know what your overall impression is. And would would you say that if you were employed there, what would you do to either get out safely or, you know, look into kind of solution finding if you are still there? Yeah, I think the first thing that, you know, it goes back to my own experience as well. I was in a very small business, relatively new, right? Um, I think I would have managed my expectations differently. So I'm going to start with like, you know, from the beginning, when you're applying for a job, like don't ever forget that you're interviewing them for, you know, as well. Um, That's one of the big things is, you know, again, we have, we've been, at least I know in my my generation in this country, the way I was raised, it was it was more of like almost like a beauty contest, right? Like, please yeah. award me something. Yay, yeah. Right. You know, award me with this job, please, please. Right. And I didn't always think of it as I have just as much that I'm bringing. Right. It was more of like this. I'm trying to get approval is the way that I approached job search. So the first thing starts there is like really getting clear on what you have to offer and being strong on that, especially today. Like you can, you can work remotely, (laughs) you know, and in most people, I mean, it depends obviously what your skills are, but, but a lot of people can work remotely or independently and, 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 control more of their work situation. So starting there and then making sure that with that confidence you're going in and being being the interviewer as well as the interviewee, right? Because I suspect for myself and maybe for you all as well, had I asked some different questions and had a different mindset about how I was going into that interview, mm-hmm. I probably would have seen the holes earlier, right? I would have seen the holes in the boat really early. Um, Whereas Gina got the holes in the boat. She got tons of. Yeah. People told told you who you were, what was happening? Everyone was like, everyone in their own way was telling me like this company's fucked up without saying this company's fucked up. I think Nicola, you got the closest, but I still, I was like, oh, it's so cute. Like nobody actually has real experience. Like I didn't know yet. Like I was being set up as coming in with having the most experience and like, you know, whatever. So it was not only was I lied to, but like within the first two weeks, I realized that the COO and the CEO didn't really know what the fuck the product development department and was doing they had they were so disconnected either that or they were so busy micromanaging they were like losing the bird's eye view which you have to have if you want your company to grow and you know move forward and have sustainability so she might know about like okay we're going to be a few days late for this project but she's not looking further ahead that we have to be working six months in advance, not two, you know, like there were so many fundamental issues and I should have left when I realized that, like when it became clear to me that the C-suite didn't even know half the issues that were going on in my department, I should have been like, I'm out of here. Like, Ciao. but there's my ego. Cause I'm like, well, okay, I can fix it. Like they're not product development. They're not supply chain experts. That's why they hired me, stupid me, thinking that they actually actually valued me and my expertise. And, right, right. That's that's the that's also that mindset that we've been taught of like you're bestowing something on me called a job. Mm-hmm. And and it and it has this illusion of being valued, right? And then it does. I mean, look, it 
you all have marketing experience. You get it because you've been trained to kind of use some of that same psychology to get people to buy stuff, right? So like I have studied so much around this also to be aware of how sometimes I'm being manipulated by the marketers to to buy things I don't need, right? (laughs) And so I think about that in the job context as well, that things I would have done differently if I were in your shoes and probably because again, I see our experiences very similar. Had I recognized that the people in leadership had almost no experience running this type of business, right? Or have any corporate experience period ever the end hard stuff. And and it, you know, and again, like there's always the possibility that somebody is going to break out and, and be an amazing but I can also see from my, from my own experience as a business owner, how much I had to relearn to mm-hmm. apply in the context of my own business, mm-hmm. right? Because I'd worked at large corporations. I'd worked at a small business that right, was but the thing great. Is, is had you not had those experiences, there's no way you could even remotely successfully create your own business. You need to have the business in a big corporation, medium-sized and small to really be able to own your own business and run it somewhat effectively. So, Because it looks a lot easier than it is. (laughs) Right. So to your point, had I had realized that this woman went from selling wedding stationery to doing this and then hired her Bible church group friend to do be a COO who was half my age and had literally no work experience nothing had that been made prevalent to me I would have been like I don't think I could do this like yeah, yeah. And, and and again there's a, there are occasionally breakout stars but what you see right. but no. is those breakout stars are doing something to fill those knowledge gaps to fill those experience gaps to hire and people I, who actually know what they're doing right but you still even to be able to supervise someone else, you have to have enough of an understanding of what they do so that you know how to recognize how to align it with the bigger picture, right? When you're in the C-suite, that's that's your job. So like, look, you know, as a little sidetrack there is I, I, I've been a little, I've been a little harsh with some of the, the corporations that have been laying people off. And then the C-suite never takes any kind of pay cut or any kind of hit because look, if you're laying people off, I get that there was a pandemic and there are circumstances you can't always see, mm-hmm. but it's a failure of management if you're having to lay off tens of thousands of people. So, you know, you have to do some self-reflection there and, and you have to fill those knowledge gaps, right? Like no one saves me, but myself, <laughs> right? I know this is a business owner. So, you know, you got to get in there. And I think it's, it's a lot of that that I recognize in your story that sounds a lot like mine many years ago. And again, it doesn't mean people can't learn, but you have to see that consistency. You have to see them. And you have to be willing to learn and be willing to self-reflect. And there was zero willingness. It was revenue, revenue, revenue. Right. Like it, like it's just going to come magically. Right. And I think that's another thing that um, a lot of things, a lot of businesses have done in with, because of technology, it is relatively easy to set up a business and it's, and it has been like, you want to file for an LLC, super easy to do, boop, 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 do it online. Right. Voila, you have this LLC, but that doesn't mean you're going to still have a, an operating business. You just have a piece of paper that says you have one, but it may not be profitable, which means you don't really have anything, right? So I think that's the other part of it is that we, again, it looks easier than it is. And I even saw that in, in the business where I went to work is I, I can see it more objectively that I had my own gaps. And quite frankly, if they had known what they were doing, maybe they wouldn't have hired me. Right. <laughs> because I can see that too. Like I worked really hard to catch up 
but there were things that I was also having to fix. You know, we say you're flying the plane while building it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I definitely was in that situation because I was having to learn how to apply a lot of my experience to a new context while also fixing a lot of issues that were created by a management team that had just never done anything like this before. Mm -hmm. And it, and, and so I see that with, I can look at it with a little bit of compassion, right? Mm -hmm. That it was their inexperience, not necessarily that they were intentionally demons, right? <laughs> um, or anything like that, but the inability to recognize your own fallibilities is a recipe for disaster and you will pull other people down with you. <laughs> anyway, Nancy, do you have anything? Because we're already over time by five minutes, and no. we don't want to keep you. But yeah, because I got, I do have a four o'clock. But I, I, I would, um, yeah, I think um, I did. You know, I did have my note. So I, I think, and I want to leave on a, on a, on a kind of an up note. You know, I think the, the number one thing that it goes back to: what do you do when you're in that? Right, when you're in that toxic workplace, and maybe mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of options to move. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the first thing is see what you can do to change them, right? Because um, I, I like to break it down as it's, yes, we call it a toxic workplace, but it's a toxic workplace that's created by a series of behaviors, right? right. That are allowed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's being very clear on what the toxic behaviors are that are causing you the most harm and mm -hmm. starting there and speaking up and not taking it, right? Mm -hmm. Um and that's including taking a look at how you're responding to them. So it's that self-reflection we go back to um, and going deep into what it is that you expect, what's not being met. Um, what do you need? To, yeah. What do you need to be successful in that job so that you can create the opportunity to ask for it? Like I mentioned earlier of getting really clear on here are the assignments that you've given me and I want to do a great job for you right? But I cannot do that and this, right? So I have to be, and you know, you try that. And, and it's the same thing I said about interviewing when you're in, in trying to engage people in the conversation, if they're not meeting you, you already know where you are, right? These are the things I wish I had known for myself earlier on is asking those questions. And it's what I see in contract negotiations too, right? If, a, if an employer hands me or a client hands me or a vendor hands me a standard contract with a bunch of terms we hadn't considered, we hadn't mm -hmm. talked about. That's also a red flag for me mm -hmm. because that tells me automatically that this is somebody who lured me in to a conversation where I thought we had an agreement and now they're adding a bunch of terms, right? That we didn't talk mm -hmm. about. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, and then if you're in that situation, Sometimes the best thing to do is start, start setting yourself up to leave. And that's, and that's why I said, like, there are a lot of opportunities out there mm -hmm. and it's, it can be difficult to find them at first. Yeah. But imagine spending that energy that you're spending, trying to change a place that's not going to change and taking that energy to move you somewhere where you're going to be happier and more effective. Cause most people want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. That's what I, you know, I, I, I always tell employers that like very rarely do you have an employee that goes into a job interview, accepts a job and says, oh my God, I can't wait to suck at this job. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like I'm going to do the worst job ever. Right? Unless you're a, unless you're a blow job giver. That's the only time I feel like you should really suck at the job. <laughs> oh, Nicola. Okay, the sexual harassment trainer is over here going, oh, so. No, we've already it, talked about like how I get, so Nicola, you will like this. I got more Botox in my how upper How do you lip. get more? You're such a numpty. Well, now it's so much that I, every morning when I'm drinking my coffee out of my coffee cup, it's like dribbling. It's like... <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is bad. And like, it's hard for me to talk really fast. Like, cause I have to sound my words out because if you notice my lip does not really move. So also, um, please tell us all the places we can find you and your book and yes, all of the cool info. You. And you know what? I meant to put a copy of the book like right here so I could go, there it is. But um, 
<laughs> so my so my book is on Amazon. It's called DIY Conflict Resolution, and it's uh so it's it's part book, part workbook. So it's got a lot of exercises in the back mm. to practice, so that you start to make this part of your your being, right? Because like you said, when you are out of practice, you don't make as good of decisions. And I want you to make good decisions and I don't want you to work in a toxic workplace, <laughs> right? So, so there's that. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn, uh, Third Year Conflict Resolution. I have my personal page there too. Um, my website is thirdearcrforconflictresolution.com and it's spelled out the word third, the word ear. Yeah, and YouTube. And I do have a YouTube channel. I drop a video. As a matter of fact, that's my four o'clock meeting um, is that I drop a video once a week with some employment tips for employers and employees on creating that employment partnership and trying to avoid these toxic workplaces because I, wow. I do feel like we're in, a, in kind of the new labor movement and um, a lot of employers don't even see it coming. And look, if you aren't getting on board with treating people with respect and you don't see the movement coming, fine. Bye. <laughs> we'll, we'll see it. We'll see you when you're trying to get it, when, when you're now going to be interviewing at a place that we're hiring at. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I firmly believe like in Raina's story, when her old ex like toxic boss was then applying for a job at her new company that she was in charge of hiring, like the poetic justice like I, I feel like, like that's yay, what's gonna happen is, that is the poetic justice you needed that yes, is what you and needed I, to and I feel like that will eventually mind. happen with something like somehow it'll all work itself out because karma is real <laughs> it is and I've I've ended up in the courtroom with people that I've um, had difficult relationships with um, I've had a former boss that of course I, you know, ran into <laughs> and, uh, and you know what, one of the things I learned is that even he, who had been a terrible boss, um, I won't say where I was working at the time, but, um, he's, mm -hmm. he's through, you know, so that's another thing to keep in mind. It's like, even though there's that poetic justice, when they're coming to you saying, please, sir, uh, give me a job. <laughs> It was right. Yeah, like being so in that well. position <laughs> yeah. is, uh, you know, still giving them the opportunity to show that they've, that they've grown and changed, but if they haven't, that's on them. It's the same yep. thing with employees that I've let go. I let them self-select termination. I give them every opportunity to stay yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and, and succeed and tell me what they need to do that. And if it doesn't work out, it's okay. It's like breaking up with a lover, right? Like if it's, if we're not compatible, that's cool. I don't want you to stay and we make each other miserable, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it has Life been, so, <laughs> well, it is. Um, it has been really awesome chatting with you. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I feel like Very I've had a good time. I don't know about anyone else, but I've had, a, I've, had a, I've had a ball. This is great. I was, I was a little nervous because I was like, I'm kind of in a different space. Are they going to eat me alive? <laughs> everyone like thinks that we're like battle axes and then we're just like wait my You're top lift can't move haha <laughs> you you all are so cool and and what you all are doing is great because i i think this is a these are conversations that need to occur mm -hmm. and people need to know that they're not alone mm -hmm. and figure that's out why we started from. this yeah not because we, we were felt so alone. employees <laughs> But because we were like, how do these two high, highly educated, highly experienced people end up like this? End up in where we were. Like this, and, it, and we've said it before, and I'll say it again. It could have been anywhere. It could have been UPS. It could have been IBM. We just happened to meet at this particular workplace. It didn't matter. We would, you know, and it's not even about the workplace. It's that the people who comprise the workplace are not willing to self-reflect. And I think that that's sort of where we wanted to highlight things as well. It's like, could this have been done differently on both yeah. ends? And the answer is most always, Absolutely. yes. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. So I'm no longer disgruntled. Yeah. You're, you know, that's the other thing that I saw. I'm yeah, like, yeah, we're gruntled now, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, but I saw the same thing is like, it was an opening for me to move to something more compatible. 
And that's why I go back to that compatibility and why I talk so much about interviewing the employer also when you're in just there. as much as they're interviewing you. Oh, yeah. The problem is, is I think for people who, you know, we're probably all in the same generation, more or less, like maybe a few years difference with you and Nicola, but you and I are definitely in the same generation. And we were taught like you're competing with other smart people to get this job mm -hmm. instead of you're going to get this job because you're, you're good at what you do and you're a smart person. So therefore you have a lot of opportunities and that might not always be true. Like I think it's, and also the, the further you get along in your career, the harder it is to find a job because your demands <clears throat> become bigger. Like I demand a pretty large salary at this point. Um, you know, I am at an executive level. I, you know, so I get it, but the right thing will eventually come along, yeah. you know? And, and people are often willing to sacrifice a little on income. And this yeah. is something to talk to employers about too. If they're going to be in a culture that allows them to be creative and grow and contribute. And I think and that that's something like we're seeing. Psychological safety, which right. was not existent in our place of work where Nick and then I, I and then when I was in HR and I would talk to my mom about some of the stuff I was, you know, I was dealing with, and she was like, that was nothing. Right. Right. So like, it's like it, it keeps, <laughs> hopefully it keeps getting better. I know. Like our my my mom too. She's like she's 84 now, but she's, there's stories, even with my dad who he's since passed, but he did work for IBM. And some of the stories he would tell me, I'd be like, whoa, that's crazy. You know? Yeah. So we're, you know, we're making progress, but we have a long way to go. And I think you guys are doing a great job of fleshing some of this out and giving people a space. Like I, that's what I saw too, is like, we basically workshopped things a little bit right? And that's what has to occur. We need spaces to talk about things, work through them, get strategies, and empower each other. And I think that's what you all are doing. And I really admire you for doing it. Yay. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. So yay. I think, I think if um, fancy Nancy, the lawyer thinks that we're doing a good job, then we're doing a good job. <laughs> I'm so not fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to turn that into a social media post. Fancy Nancy. Yes, you have be care, to be, make sure you spell it with the E so you don't get sued by the people that have the book. Wait, <laughs> There's, a there a There's a children's oh, book. There's a children's book. Yeah. 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 Is it? Is Yeah. It's fan, yeah. Okay. Yes, you're right. Who, didn't someone famous write it? I think Probably. it was like um, Jimmy Fallon or something. Oh, really? Um, so yes, I'm going to bounce, ladies. I have so loved being with you, but I'm going to go record my video now. All go right. ahead. Okay. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Bye. See you later. Bye. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. If you would like to share your story, we would love to hear from you. Also, leaving a review helps us create more content because it shows us there's an interest in this topic. For those of our listeners who do better with reading, we have closed caption available on YouTube. See you next week. Same time and same place.